tops us at the very front, a little abstract of all of this. And then this is something that um, uh, I wrote a few years ago uh, as we were finishing this 30-year restoration of the Smith Bending House in Candler Park. It was a, certainly a labor of love, but uh, one of the things that I think you might find remarkable unless you uh, have been around for all that time and saw it in its before condition that we're going to look at a few before and afters and take a look at um, the general uh, efforts that we made to make it livable and bring it into the uh, 21st century in terms of a habitable house. It was absolutely derelict when we when we bought the, uh, the Smith Benning house. How are we doing? Are we... Okay. I'm afraid if I, I'm going to be looking that way every once in a while, but that's all right. Anyway, so this is a um, uh, presentation that reviews a 21st century restoration of DeKalb County's National Register listed Smith Benning House. Candler Park itself is on the National Register, but we actually put the Smith Benning House on the National Register before the neighborhood went on, and so it is also individually uh, listed. But it's also, I'd like to present this in the light of some competing preservation philosophies about historic compatibility and the avoidance of fictitious history. When a historic structure is severely deteriorated, the fabric is lost. So when is duplication in restoration ill-advised? How do you modernize for a contemporary use a house that is more than 100 years old without either faking history, as some suggest, or abusing context on the other side. And so in an effort to maintain integrity, that is the buzzword of the National Register, the fundamental standard of the Department of Interior guidelines for historic preservation, is it preferable to introduce obviously non-historic elements in order to avoid any impression of the new materials or elements that might appear old or even original than to employ like elements or even preserve fragments from other lost structures in order to provide visual compatibility. Uh, if additions are built as new wings or outbuildings, must these be obviously non-historic in order to ensure no misunderstanding that they may be original to the historic house? Now, you all know that debate. I mean, it's come up many, many times. In avoiding what I've sometimes called fictitious history, when is context and compatibility the sacrificial lamb at the altar of integrity of materials, form, ornament, place, or function? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, it is slightly provocative. I know some of you who are in historic preservation offices will think that it's blasphemy, but nevertheless, there is some. Uh, I think worth raising the question. So the title of the paper, The Ivory Tusk Syndrome, is a metaphor. It refers to the point of view reflected in preservation and restoration philosophies that the reuse of architectural fragments in historic buildings motivates architectural bounty hunters to go out and tear down more buildings simply to extract their fragments and to sell them on the open market. <clears throat> Buyers in this market are perceived to be misguided restorationists, metaphoric collectors of ivory tusks, who place such high value on the historic fragment as embodiments of a craftsmanship nearing extinction, and with the added value of the fragments being authentic with respect to style, historic period, form, and detail, that they would go around destroying other landmarks in order to pirate the tusks. That's the view that in part generates the prohibition of using architectural fragments. The game wardens of our architectural preserves, those tax act reviewers and national register review boards, I can say this because I served for many years on the review board, point out rightly that one, when graves are robbed and the ivory is taken away to bejewel another architectural body, the authenticity breaks down, specifically with respect to the authenticity of place. Use of architectural fragments is therefore discouraged in hopes of preventing other Victorian elephants 
from being shot by poachers intent on salvaging their most valuable parts, which poachers use in building restorations, additions, or outbuildings, with the added benefit of increased compatibility. On the basis of this issue of authenticity of place, review boards deny National Register recognition to buildings that have been moved, and for the same reason, they discourage the employment of a copied period ornament or the reuse, for instance, of an historic bracket salvaged from a demolished period building. Pirating ivory tusks is not only misguided, it is considered criminal. Such acts break the laws of authenticity of place with the threatened penalty of forfeiture of National Register listing. So this question of authenticity of place trumps all other justifications, leaving rehabilitation architects and home renovators with compromising alternatives that threaten aesthetic quality, psychic or emotional comfort, and compatible new design. Why? Because contrast and differentiation rule. The institutionalizing of this philosophy and the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation has the benefit of protecting the white elephants, so the argument goes. Our increasing modern technological and history rejecting world considered Victorian residences more and more to be behemoths or dinosaurs best left to, the nat to die natural causes. If you live in a Victorian house or seek to rehabilitate an otherwise lost relic of 19th century design, heaven forbid that you should encourage reusing tusks. Any such employment or transplanted fabric is a transmogrification to be avoided as fictitious history. Oops, wrong way, sorry. The Secretary of Interior standards of rehabilitation are now 46 years old. In four years, they'll have crossed the 50-year rule and be eligible themselves for listing on the National Register as an historic document. As this audience well knows, the Secretary's standards state the following in the sub on the subject of the relationship between a historic building <clears throat> and its modern reuse. Guideline number three. Each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Changes that create a false sense of historic development, such as adding contextual features or architectural elements from other buildings, shall not be undertaken. In other words, no ivory tusks. On the other hand, guideline number four states, most properties change over time, those changes that have required historic significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. So here we have an interesting case in point in Augusta. The 1918 Lamar building with its toaster rooftop penthouse, as I heard somebody nickname it, I never heard it called a toaster, but it's an IMP penthouse added presents an interesting case, perhaps introducing the dilemma and the interaction between history and modernity. The National Historic Preservation Act was passed in 1966. The legislature authorized the Secretary of the Interior to expand and maintain the National Register of Historic Places and to administer a program of direct grants for the preservation of properties included on the National Register and to, quote, establish professional standards for the preservation of historic properties. An informal 50-year rule soon defined historic and eligibility for the register in general. The Lamar Building was built between 1913 and 1918. It, it was well underway and it had a fire and then it got delayed and it didn't really get finished until 1918. So by 1966, when the National Register was established, the building was almost 50 years old. First guidance per, published for administering the grants, the first got published guidance for historic properties, appeared in 1973. It was developed by the Office of Archaeology and Historic Preservation and issued by the National Park Service. 
Adaptive reuse of an historic property was recognized as a type of restoration. A treatment, the policies document stated, quote, the National Park Service recognizes adaptive use of historic properties as a useful means of preservation. An historic property is improved or restored for adaptive use when all or a portion, let's say the facade, of the exterior is restored with the interior adapted to a contemporary functional use. Adaptive restoration to the, approach, to the appropriate treatment for structures that are visually important in the historic scene, but do not otherwise qualify for exhibit, uh, exhibition purposes. So they kind of stretch it a little bit for adaptive reuse. What is to be done about a building addition and the debate regarding compatibility versus distinctly modern forms and materials that purposeful of that purposely declare their non-historic modernity as a non-original addition. What about I.M. Pei's rooftop toaster? An interesting sequence followed the 1973 publication of the Department of Interior's Policies and Procedures. I.M. Pei built his distinctive Lamar Building penthouse the following year, in 1974 to 75. The Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation were developed in 1976 and published in 1977. Two years later, in 1979, the Lamar Building, with its highly visible I.M. Pei hat, was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Every bit of it. This past weekend at the Georgia Trust Ramble in Augusta, I had occasion to converse with an architect whose body of work includes sensitive building additions to historic districts and the general subject of compatibility rose naturally from our conversations within the very shadow of the historic Lamar building with its toaster rooftop penthouse less than compatibly adorning the skyline. That certainly is not faking history, we remarked. And then in a less than genteel metaphor, my architect friend remarked, I think the Secretary of Interior Standards has its head up its <clears throat> and did not finish the sentence I thought back to my own experience in restoring the 1885 Smith Benning House, a project recognized with awards from the Atlanta Urban Design Commission and the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation, but quote, marginally passed, unquote, by the state office overseeing the Tax Act, by which HPO blessing was required in order to trigger the tax benefit. The project nearly became the victim of the Ivory Tusk Syndrome. We can assume, I think, you'd agree, that a 125-year-old building, and I'm just talking hypothetically now, I'm not talking about the Smith Benning House, but let's say an 1885 Victorian house has changed over time. And in the light of this discussion, perhaps we can suggest hypothetically some possible changes that may well have occurred in the history of a long-standing residence. For example, 50 years after construction, let's say in 1935, a new owner of our hypothetical 19th century house repairs or makes an addition to the property, seeking to ensure in that rehabilitation some level of compatibility. He installs in 1935 an architectural fragment from a demolished 1885 house as a harmonious and sympathetic addition to his own restoration in the 30s. In 1935, the owner does not have the advantage of the secretary's standards, but he does seek to avoid in his rehab gestures that would overtly modernize his Victorian house in incompatible ways. So the styles of his own day, Art Deco, or depression modern, or streamlined modern, or just plain modern abstractions are out. No modernized Main Street here. But our 1930s preservationist has broken the as yet unstated guideline number three by reusing an architectural element from another Victorian building, however comfortable the fit and however compatible the fragment might be to his 1885 house this will soon be declared verboten in the system. 75 years later, in 2010, that misguided 1930s work is now historic. So it too should be preserved in order to show, as guideline number four states, that the property changes over time. 
that they have, quote, acquired historic significance in their own right. Nonetheless, the 2010 view is that the 1930s installation of that fragment borrowed from another building, like any such inauthentic but compatible feature installed after the fact, was misguided. And that's the dilemma of the ivory tusk syndrome. Today's standards declare that the 1930s reuse of an extracted fragment risks fooling posterity. Similarly, a 21st century employment of a carefully observed but duplicated or extracted architectural ornament is co comparably forgery. The building part, whether it is a reproduced balustrade, a duplicated bracket, an addition of a whole room in order to add indoor plumbing, or an outbuilding, and now we can go to our restoration, um, is uh, newly designed to accommodate the owner's automobile. These sympathetic alterations, compatible or not, are not original to the owner's Victorian house. And so any affixed fragments are therefore inauthentic. In 2010, shall we remove as non-conforming or preserve the misguided 1930s fragment as part of the continuity of history and the life of the house? It is likely that both the owner in the Great Depression, and again, I'm talking generally, and the house restorer in 2010, that brings it a little bit more personally, sought the same level of compatibility, doing their job so well that without dendrochronology, the rehabilitation work might be mistaken for genuine, that is, genuine 1885 fabric. Most assuredly, to preserve authenticity and to worship at the altar of contrast and differentiation, the 1935 homeowner might have turned to vitrolite, bakelite, neon, and machine-in-sized faceted deco prof profiles just as readily as um, today's restorationists or uh, designers of additions to historic buildings could contrast and distinguish the new from the old by employing Miesian steel, Frank Gehry's idiosyncratic formalism, or Leeds certified and sustainable bronze anodized mullionless plate glass windows, any one of which uses ensures that no one would mistake the new for the historic fabric. Georgia Tech spent a huge period in the 80s uh, taking all the windows out of its buildings and putting anodized um, energy efficient windows in with no mullions whatsoever and they have more recently gone back and restored them all back to the way they should have been in the first place. Um, Stephen Semmes, on the other hand, has recently provided an articulate, quote, conservation ethic for architecture, urbanism, and historic preservation, unquote. And he writes, ultimately, there is no such thing as false history in architecture. Truth or falsehood are qualities that we may attribute to historic accounts or interpretations, but not to buildings, which may only be judged good or bad appropriate or inappropriate, unquote. Guideline number three is generated by the preservation movement's fear of forgery, Sims. So he asks, how do we maintain the formal integrity and historic character of monuments if we are obliged to add to a pre-existing setting only what is alien to it in order to be sure that it contrasts adequately with it, unquote. He suggests that historic style, and I might translate the word style to mean formal language, is embodied in architecture but is not limited to an historic period. He suggests that style is like a literary genre that may be employed at various times. Excuse me, I should have told you to turn these off. <laughs> Seems everybody's going off at the same time. There it goes. Sorry. He suggests that style is like a literary genre that may be employed at various times and for various reasons 
persisting and changing in the development of a literature. Not limited to a singular historic period, style is, quote, the conscious and public cultivation of the appropriate as discerned by a community. Styles often remain applicable in physical and temporal contexts different from those in which they first appear. Of course, we create revivalist buildings all the time. To build in an historic style is not to pretend to be living in another time, sentence writes, nor is it an attempt to deceive, unquote. Well, like the modernist vanguard call for a new architecture, Sem's conservation ethic calls for the preservation community to endorse a new rehabilitation, quote, the rehabilitation of the concept of style independent of historic sequence, unquote. In conflict with the prohibition of what is claimed to be restoration falsities is the question of compatibility in historic restoration, an issue which particularly raises its head when original fabric is missing or a piece of ornament or structural element in a historic building is irreparable. Changing lifestyles add further complications. It did not seem unreasonable when my wife and I bought our Victorian fixer-upper for my wife to request that we not live in a museum. On the other hand, as an architectural historian and owner of a landmark Atlanta house, I was anxious to ensure high levels of compatibility of design in anything added or restored, avoiding both suburban taste and modern intrusions, which I find as painful as the metaphoric fingernail scratching on the blackboard. This is a photograph, by the way, taken probably right when the house was finished. It's from the DeKalb Historical Society right here and uh, is showing, uh, it, it is on the same photographic backing as two portraits of, uh, of uh, Smith and his wife and they look like they're college kids. I mean, they're absolutely, you know, I don't know how old they were at the time, but anyway. Our newly purchased house was a wreck. Preservation would require of us every level of activity envisioned by the phrase saving an old house, as well as that other phrase, the money pit. We wanted to make it right, but the house was missing so many of its teeth that major reconstruction surgery was needed. Guideline number nine notes, quote, new work shall be differentiated from the old, unquote, but goes on to call for compatibility in massing, size, scale, and architectural features in order to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. The prohibition of reused fragments, what I'm calling the ivory tusk syndrome, presented a significant dilemma. How seamless should the old and the new be? Again, we must not fool posterity. The new God was contrast. Yet toward this end, modern architects have considered as meritorious and with full seriousness the notion that a Frank Gehry wing should be added to a Beaux-Arts Corcoran Institute. Um, and when Quinlan and Francis Terry inserted a traditional townhouse front comfortably within the streetscape of Baker Street in London, Critics called it pastiche. This view on the right is not 18th century, but is 20th century. Pastiche, it was dismissed as. Stephen Sims sees the call for violent differentiation, that is the Corcoran on the top and the Corcoran addition on the bottom, as intellectually lazy or worse. He writes, quote, in truth, the view that the new architecture should conform, could, should confront the old in a spirit of opposition is probably the easiest solution. It certainly makes the least intellectual or artistic demands on the architect or the critic, unquote. Well, I love his suggestion that if a modern architect simply doesn't get it, he should at least leave it alone. Sems proposes a Hippocratic oath as a requirement for restoration on compatible additions for historic districts and landmarks. First, do no harm, the doctors say. In 
1982, the Smith Banning House was on its deathbed. So it was very unlikely when my wife and I started the rehabilitation that we would do the house any harm. Most neighbors thought we were mad even to tackle it and its preservation. The East Lake Victorian residence with its mansard roofed tower, collapsed veranda, gutted interior, leaking roof, had been converted to four apartments in the 1960s, but had not been maintained for two decades. The house was generally too far gone for anyone other than an architectural historian with no common sense to try to save it. If this house had anything going for it, it was potential. My wife and I made a quick decision. I suggested to Carol that we sell our comfortable 1960s split-level house in suburbia and immediately move into our newly acquired Adams family house. We installed a 600 square foot brand new apartment in the old rear kitchen, already gutted by a previous owner. It seemed like a good idea that we live on the property, only slightly better than camping out while fixing up the main house, not envisioning that our just turned three-year-old son would be 30 with his own three-year-old child before we finished the restoration. One day my wife encountered a fire truck and a fire crew in the front yard scoping the house for a possible controlled fire exercise to train the men on the fire crew. They were going to burn the house down for practice. Certainly no one could possibly be living there, they surmised. There is inadequate time to describe the restoration in full, but here's the after. With respect to the ivory tusk syndrome, some issues the restoration raised are relevant and worth sharing with you. The extensive missing or irreparable fabric required us to find craftsmen who could duplicate lathe turned 19th century ornament or work up compatible trim of unique profile or reproduce other features ranging from the replacement of balustrades to new um, stencil topped window trim. We preserved, repaired, and reused original fabric even beyond reason, but whole sections of pickets were missing along the south veranda, long ago replaced by class, uh, cast iron plumbing pipe stretched from post to post with virtually nothing below it. The base of the veranda posts had long since rotted and had been repaired with concrete shoes a bit of architectural footwear which we intended not to preserve no matter how long it had been there. We simply had to copy the posts in new cedar and at full height camp for them to match the original and reinstall. In fact, we had to rebuild the veranda from ground up. Two of the original posts, too short to reuse in the veranda, you know the old adage, you can't stretch wood, became features in the new kitchen edition. You can see the original, no, you can't, now you can't. Uh, you can see the original uh, veranda posts and then uh, it's matched. The post is original from the front porch, shorter than needed to be replaced on the front porch, and then stripped down uh, and reused in the kitchen. Carol stripped, stained, and refinished them to provide a memory of the old in the new section of the house. It was ironically an ivory tusk or architectural fragment from our own house. In the meantime, every section of the East Lake veranda ornament high enough atop the veranda post to be better protected through the years by the roofing but still in terrible condition was dismantled, number coded, renovated and put back in its original location, successfully restoring one of the house's most distinguishing features, these lathe-turned East Lake ornaments. Every piece of this is original. On the other hand, what should be done to make the gutted and uninhabitable house livable, especially with respect to the non-existent kitchen and bathrooms? 
Preservationists seem not to worry much about bathroom compatibility and may look the other way um, when new laundry rooms were installed in historic houses. But Carol was unwilling to pose like some courier in Ives print while cooking from a cast iron pot swinging over a huge kitchen fire in an authentic 19th century hearth. No, my wife definitely wanted a new kitchen. She had, in fact, personally stripped, restored, and refinished what we calculated to be well over a linear mile of woodwork throughout the whole house, including tackling the 12-foot pocket doors from high atop scaffolding. So she was going to get a new kitchen. What style should it be? The space at the back of the house that had served as the historic kitchen, a one-story gabled section with side open porches since enclosed. You can see that coming out in, in behind the main house on the screen. It had long since been gutted, and when we acquired the house, only framing and open walls existed there. This section of the house served temporarily <clears throat> as our tiny 650-square-foot apartment intended eventually to convert to a new kitchen for our modern lifestyle in a significantly enlarged space. That alteration would be the last stage of the project and it took somewhere between 27 and 30 years to get to it. Throughout this period, Carol prepared meals in a 50 square foot apartment kitchen about the size of a galley on a small boat. The new kitchen would be one place where she wanted contrast and differentiation, to quote the National Register. Should the new kitchen not also reflect the personality of the owners, who did not want contemporary styling, nor did they want to exhume some assumed image of whatever an East Lake Victorian kitchen might have originally looked like? Guideline number three's prohibition against conjectural features would apply. But what style should it be? If Sims is right, that style need not be limited in some contained historic period, but is a genre to be adopted when there was more than one option. In the end, my interest in the quality of craftsmanship and design associated with the arts and crafts movement inspired the new kitchen installation. In a continuing historic character, an option much preferred over a modern stainless steel, self-evidently non-Victorian kitchen. So I designed a synthesis of borrowings from Bernard Maybeck, who I wrote my dissertation on, and Green and Green, the great arts and crafts artists, in a single great room of some 1,400 square feet, considerably larger than the entire apartment kitchen that we've been living in, spatially marked by open modern planning and we'll go inside that kitchen in a moment. <clears throat> in order for the kitchen to be compatible on the exterior, we restored the original one-story gable kitchen structure projecting from the rear of the big house, and this was a big house, breezeway, little house arrangement, and then we twinned this form with the second gable, not quite a duplicate, set back slightly to show that it's different. Um, the right is new, the, uh, uh, excuse me, the left is new, the right is the original kitchen form. A few newly installed windows were trimmed with surrounds inspired by the trim of the attic vents of the main house, and we committed a sin or two by installing architectural fragments to help create compatible entry hoods over the new eight-foot French doors leading into the new rear veranda. The historic trim, the clabberting, the windows of the original South Gable kitchen, all that was preserved. The deck itself was newly designed but compatible with posts, tight camphored pickets, and rails modeled on the front veranda. Also included a deck flooring not constructed out of suburban two by eights because we didn't want it to look like a deck. We wanted it to look like a veranda. So we used one by four Ippy wood, which is a Brazilian hardwood of triple the density and dead load capacity of two by four pines, but with the aesthetic merit of transforming our back deck into an open veranda, 
compatible with the rest of the house. Inside, under both gabled roofs, is a single great room, a free open space of multiple ceiling heights. The entire roof system is supported by three hidden triple 2 by 12 laminated beams spanning a space that needs no interior posts. The reused but shortened original veranda posts can be removed and as they have no structural role. Um, the truss ceilings are made back in using newly designed overscaled king post trusses and scissor trusses for the respective gables. See, I can, as the architectural historian, stand in one space and tell students that's a cane post, stand in another post, that's a scissors arch, uh, post, scissors arch. And borrowing Maybeck in colors, and why not? Outside, we installed an overscaled garden pergola with Maybeckian dragons aimed, east, or aimed westward at the incompatible 1950s apartments, our early modern neighbors, so these dragons are aimed right over to them, and as Maybeck would say it, in order to keep the evil spirits away. The major inspiration for the kitchen interior was the work of Green and Green, both in terms of the rich color and the patina of their joinery and the detailing of window and door trim that I designed with an intended character that here had a major impact on the kitchen cabinetry cabinetry that we intended to be compatible. So this is a detail of one of the uh, treatments that I gave to the window trim on the inside. We looked for well over two years for proper kitchen cabinets and even ordered some $35,000 worth of cherry cabinets based on a model showroom sample, the whole layout bought and paid for. However, when the cabinets were delivered, they were as light in color and as dead in tone as emaciated maple. I don't know if you know the sort of tone differences between light 1950s suburban maple and good rich cherry, but this was not green and green's palette, and certainly not craftsmanly or what we wanted in relationship to what else was elsewhere in the house. So I bellowed and demanded my money back. Cherry will darken with age, the supplier insisted. I don't have that much time, I insisted. <laughs> so we started again. And to make a long story short, there ensued another round of wood samples, test stains, finishes, sample doors, and multiple consultations that would try the patience of a saint before the ordeal ended with, and it appeared we had found a match of color and finish with the new company. The new cabinets were ordered, and at the last minute, the high-end supplier mentioned that crown molding was standard atop those cabinets. And I yelled, ah, crown molding? I don't want suburbia on my cabinets. That would never do, because stock crown was comparable to a much different uh, suburban mega mansion imagery, but not my historic house. So the solution was to customize the custom line. We had already done that in redesigning the Marvin custom line windows. I designed an arts and crafts bracketed shelving for the kitchen atop the cabinets that would crown all wall cabinets with seven inch vertical extensions and seven inch horizontal projections making shelves supported by some 45 handcrafted and color matched brackets. Caro volunteered to stain and refinish all this new work in order to blend seamlessly with what it had taken two cabinet companies and now four years to finalize in the kitchen cabinets. I should tell you that when we first hired a professional to do the stripping and the staining in the house, uh, because when they were turned into apartments, a lot of the doors and trim had been painted white, and we wanted to get it back to the original um, heart of pine. Uh, so we've refinished the floors, and, and Carol stripped, and, and I'd, I'd introduce her at academic parties as the stripper. Uh, she was stripping the wood and, and had this extraordinary uh, thought early on when we were paying a lot for this so-called professional and all of the milking was just not coming out well at all. And Carol said, you know, um, we're paying a fortune and getting a bad job. I'm cheap and I can do a bad job, so why don't we just 
give me a crack at it. And she learned the trade, and it's just absolutely exquisite. People look at those pocket doors inside, and they think they're looking at a Chippendale 18th century piece of wood. So the woodwork created a remarkable blend of factory reproduced cabinets and on-site craftsmanship. That's something of the overall character of the room. It's a little hard to, to see. I'm sorry we have such bad lighting in here, but um, um, the images are, they look better on my screen than they do on yours, I'm afraid. Um, the last masterful touch in the kitchen, um, at least according to the preservation guidelines, would be styled in any form because it's not visible from the public right of way. So we could be a little bit looser in the kitchen. When we applied for our final tax act review, the State Historic Preservation Office said we barely passed. For one thing, I didn't care, we passed. <laughs> um, for one thing, they didn't like the outbuilding I designed in 2004 in the side yard as a workshop above a two-car garage below. Here you can see how it works with the pergola and the, and the garage underneath. The ladder was hidden away and accessed by a depressed driveway at the very rear of the house in order to hide the 20th century automobile. I was trying to fake history, they said, because the workshop had employed some decorative trim poached from another long demolished Victorian house. Now true, we had bought at a flea market a one foot length of frieze. We took it apart to see how it was made and asked our carpenter to create 96 linear feet of a matching frieze to go around the new workshop uh, just under the overhanging E. I also trimmed uh, the building with Italian eight brackets. The main eaves were adorned with 16 such brackets. We had found uh, eight of them, I think, or 10 maybe, in a flea market, had to replicate the others. Um, and then the cupola employed eight more brackets crafted entirely anew at two-thirds the scale of the main brackets. So these ornamental elements brought this outbuilding um, into um, what we thought was a compatible design to the main house. The problem was this, the tax reviewer noted, although designed in the 21st century, that my outbuilding was so compatible that people will think it's Victorian. I was faking history. I guess I had done too good a job <laughs> uh, to make it um, palatable. My view was that the workshop was sensitively scaled to a one-story building on the front, presented a compatible elevation, but underneath was a car garage, walled in concrete, and self-evidently a two-car garage, which I doubted anyone would date due to its function to 1883. On the other hand, I had to confess that I wanted a certain level of 19th century compatibility in this new outbuilding with its 20th century function. Is such a use of ivory tusks on a two-car garage an intended historic forgery, trying too hard to look Victorian? Or is this a means to ensure a preferred contextual sensitivity? So I got a D minus grade but I suspected or I accepted the pass as an adequate qualification to get a, a little relief on the property taxes. As I mentioned earlier, I am pleased to add that we received two balancing assessments taking different views about the success of the rehab. In 2010, the mayor of Atlanta recognized the preservation of the uh, Smith's Benning House with an Urban Design Commission Award as its finished uh, projection and the Georgia Trust uh, for Historic Preservation granted the project a restoration and stewardship award in a statewide competition. In the end, I guess I prefer to have crossed the line of the ivory tusk dilemma, barely passing the secretary standards but avoiding the plague of too obvious a differentiation and contrast. In retirement, I plan to gaze out of my not so suburban rear deck toward the fictitious history of an entirely too compatible workshop and garage, content that this is preferable, perhaps, to passing with flying colors on the basis of restoring an historic building whose new fabric looks spanking new and thus would not prompt anyone to mistake it as genuine Victorian. I agree with Stephen Sem's definition of the quintessential principle of a conservation ethic 
quote, the criteria that matters most is the appropriateness to its setting of a proposed intervention rather than conf conformance with concurrently fashionable ideas, unquote, maybe even current notions about preservation. In part, Sem's clarion call and mine is for a closer look at the question of aesthetic compatibility in the conservation, adaptive reuse, and consequential alteration of a living historic architecture. Thank you. Uh, yes. Is your home on Oakdale, not too far from Maryland School? Yes, it's um, it's about a block. It's on Oakdale and Benning. Benning is. Uh, uh, named for Captain Benning of the Smith Benning House. Just to give you a little bit of history of the house, um, we think it was built somewhere between 1882, three to five by um, Judge um, uh, Charles Whiteford Smith. Uh, his middle name was given to the street that ran in front of the house, not originally, not when he was there, but later. And of course, it was changed in the 60s to Oakdale because Candler Park wanted to seem like more like Druid Hills, so it sort of said we'd rather kind of carry Oakdale down into that far, and went down as far as the tracks. On the other side of the tracks, which is Edgewood, it still is called Whiteford, which is Charles Whiteford Smith's middle name. Um, he stayed in that house for about, we think, five or six years. Um, the 14-foot ceilings downstairs and the 13-foot ceilings upstairs with small, cold burning fireplaces made it very cold and those first years that he was there had some really harsh winters and so he decided he didn't want to stay there and, and left the house after just we think five or six years um, built a house across the street from that uh, and a little further down toward mcclendon in where there are some apartments now that house does not survive but his original house does uh, it was in the second house that he formed the local edgewood church um, on mcclendon um, he sold the house to Augustus Benning, who was a sea captain out of Savannah, um, somewhat retired, uh, came to Atlanta and bought the house. While he was here, uh, he was one of the businessmen who built the Flatiron Building downtown. There was a handful of them, and, I, and uh, so he was uh, well known. During the time of his captaincy in, in the sea trade, he was back and forth between China and he had a family in China and one here as well. So um, apparently it was not at the same time, but uh, 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 there is family history that, that goes back and knows something about the uh, Chinese family as well. Um, Benning stayed in the house for a very long time. His son was born in the upstairs bedroom and when we bought the house, his son was still alive and living in what was called the winter house. Uh, originally the property stretched um, four or five lots wide and 750 feet deep, all the way down to Euclid, uh, covering all those apartments that are behind the Smith Bunning House. It got split up multiple times, um, but in 1905, uh, even the Bennings found it too cold to stay in the house, and they decided to build what they called the Winter House, which was built um, to the uh, north of the main house, what is today across the street Benning Place that's now between. But at the time um, uh, the apartments were built in the 1950s, the city required a road to be run between the winter house and the big house. And that road was given the Benning's name because it ran right through the Benning property. And it only runs about two blocks. It runs from Candler Park at the east end to Euclid Avenue at the down the hill at the west end, and, and they're just Oakdale's the only street in between. Um, the Bennings uh, stayed in the winter house for a very long time. Uh, Mrs. Benning, the widow of Captain Benning, was there for quite a long time with her son. Um, well, actually, she stayed in the main house. When she died, the son, I think, lived more in the, um, in the uh, winter house. And the daughter, um, Elizabeth Benning taught English at Lovett for many, many years. So if any of you had kids in Lovett, you may have studied Rabelais with her, who knows, you know, or, you know English literature, foreign literature. Um, and she lived for much of the end of her life, uh, although she did move before she died um, 
out of the winter house. We had the winter house for a short time thinking we might live there instead of in that tiny little apartment. I ended up renting it for a few years and then sold it because it was uh, it just we needed a little money to fix the big house up. So it leveraged that a little bit better. Uh, and then um, the uh, house was vacant for quite a bit of time. Uh, it had, as I say, in the 60s, after the um, road had been cut through, it was converted to four apartments, um, one on either side of the central hallway, which is, goes from under the tower all the way through the house, um, and on both levels. So there's the, the rooms on, on all four of these apartments were identical. There was a, a living room and a bedroom and then a small kitchen and bath in the back, and that's what was on each side of the apartments. Under the staircase, there were four gas meters, and but again, it didn't, when we got the house, it had not even been occupied as apartments. It was absolutely unlivable, and uh, um, so we we started um, the restoration about when the house was about a hundred years old. And uh, uh, as I say, it took us nearly thirty years to to get it done. So, yes. Well, no, I think that they, they, there's a little bit more sympathy f for that if you've got a missing piece that you, you know, like a balustrade and you've got, you know, 80 of them across the uh, veranda and, and 15 of them are missing, so you are going to duplicate them to try to put the new ones in there. I think the ivory tusk idea and the metaphor is that you're, you're, you're taking, you're taking some uh, period piece from a house of the same age, but from somewhere else, upstate New York or wherever it may be, that you find in a flea market and reusing it somehow. Um, I think some of it has to do with how it gets reused and whether it clearly is in a, in a, uh, in a um, interior non-visible space and, and in, a, in a use that's compatible but may not be exactly as it was originally used. I mean, we, we were faced with the fact that all those posts that were so rotten at the base on the veranda that we couldn't use any of them again. So we had to duplicate those, uh, recamp for them and make them exactly as they originally were in more permanent you know, uh, materials. We then took the best of the, um, of the uh, cut off ones that were shorter than they were on the veranda and figured out what that height would be and then uh, design the ceiling arrangements and the structural arrangements in the back house and reuse some of those as uh, what appear to be supports, but they're not really doing anything because that whole kitchen was um, totally open with no walls and no posts when those land beams were finished. And then we just placed things more ornamentally than anything else. And that was a matter of decorating, I think, in, in, in that sense and trying to keep something relatively comparable. Would you mind just drawing the line, the line to the uh, to the ivory tusk? The analogy. What, well, what's, what's the equivalent? Yeah, in the analogy. The analogy is that you can't buy ivory anymore because it encourages poachers to go kill a bunch of elephants. And so the 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 metaphor suggests that any reuse of a fragment, anything, anytime you go to the wrecking bar and buy something from an old house and take it to your house and reuse it. You were somehow encouraging people to go out and kill more elephants, you know, knock down more houses to get the fragments because the fragments are valuable. Now, what really happens is there are other reasons these houses go, and there are scavengers and there are antique dealers who will buy bits that they think are wor worth preserving where the whole house can't be preserved. And so you see it with light fixtures and you see it with all kinds of things. But the argument against the fragmentation or the reuse is that you're, you're suggesting that that is original, which it's not. You're suggesting that it, it may in fact be older than it really is because it may not be exactly a period piece, but it seems compatible. It's borrowed from somewhere else, so it's not a it's not an Atlanta, Georgia fabric that's in that house. It's somewhere else. You don't know where that flea market guy got it. Well, you may know, but it may not be. So all of that is 
where it's a loose analogy, but it's, it's it, that's where the, uh, the my argument against that is that it really is not motivating people to go down and tear down houses for these things. It's it, uh, but that is why you can't buy ivory anymore because it motivates people for the high value of it to go kill elephants. And, uh, so that's where the analogy is. We have time for one more question. I'm going to hang around. If you'd like to see some of the books that I've written in the back, we're having those for sale. We have to have uh, a couple of them are discounted, and uh, uh, some of them are new. There are a lot of them are about Atlanta architecture. I'll say a word or two about those in a minute, but let me get Carol's question first. Um, well, I just wanted to make a comment. I'm having been a tax assistant coordinator for five years for the city, not time I mean, one of the big dilemmas, which was more than 50 years old, was that probably sometime in the 40s, the entire house had been wrapped in that asbestos that everybody was selling in the 1940s, those, those panels. So we had to go to a great deal of, you know, armored people, you know, covered up with all kinds of stuff to get rid of all of that. And what we found underneath was a very well-protected original clavering, which made it very easy to, to get a really good uh, final restored skin on the building because that had protected that but we did have to get rid of that ironically it was historic at the time we started it it was over 50 years old so, or at the time we finished uh, just a quick word about these books um, I, sometimes I, I call some of my COVID books because after I retired in 2011 and then COVID hit I had no place to go so I just sat and whipped out all these books you know and uh, so an awful lot of them are, are, are relatively new. Um, they are of two types over there. There, there are two or three um, uh, architectural history books about Atlanta. There's one about another architect who uh, did some work on a college, but it was interesting because it won two book awards and it also was described by William Hasbrook, who ran the biggest architectural bookstore in, in Chicago, if not the country as the most complete study of an architectural commission ever written. So, I mean, it got a really nice review from, from him about that. Um, so it, it has an interesting general interest, even though you may not know Maybach very well. Um, he's a California architect who designed and built this college in the 30s, uh, 20s and 30s. Um, there's a book of memoirs of Vietnam vets there, if you know anybody in the military. This is uh, an extraordinary thing that came out of a high school reunion where I was, um, a friend of mine from Oregon said, why don't we get together and share sea stories and, and see who had been in the military, because we were in school in the 60s, and anybody who was in school in the 60s was off to Vietnam or off in, in the service or whatever. So we decided we'd do this, and a handful of people showed up and were sharing what their military experience was, and somebody said, why don't we see if we might get a book out of this, and uh, and, and see if we could get more people that we knew, classmates and this, that, and the other to contribute. So we put a call out, and the first, I always tell this story because I think it's really interesting, uh, the first response we got was from Berlin, Germany. And the uh, correspondent said, I, I went to the college, so I, I heard about this book that you're planning. I never was in the military, and I'm a woman. And I'm thinking, why is she writing me? I mean, you know, this, this is all about trying to solicit military experiences from people who we presume would be male, but it would have to be, but she said she was never in the military. So then she said, but you might be interested in my story. I was an international journalist and I was stationed in Saigon and I was captured by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Do you want my story? <laughs> and I said, oh yes, I think we'd like that. So I wrote my friend in Oregon. I said, well, we've got your story and we've got my story and we've got one hell of a third story, so we're on the way. We ended up with 34 vets and they are telling their own story. You may know Tom Brokaw's book called The Greatest Generation, which is based on interviews of vets from World War II. 
Brokaw interviewed all those people and he wrote their stories themselves. I wanted these guys to write their own stories. And so these are accounts written 50 years later of experiences in all four of the major services, Marines, aircraft, Air, Air Force, uh, Navy, and Army. Um, very few of them were career people, about five or six of the 34 were, were, were maybe even four were career, became career. They didn't know at the time they were gonna stay in, but they did. But everybody else just did their job. One of my friends was um, in the Marines. He, he, he lands in, 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 uh, on the edge of uh, the northern part of South Vietnam at the air base. As he's getting off the plane to start his 13-month tour of duty in Vietnam, he sees walking across to get on the plane to go home a fraternity brother of his who is just finishing his career. Now this school that these guys went to had a, a, a population of 500. The student population was 500. Half were men and half were women. So you've got 250 men, which means about 50 or 60 graduated every graduation class. And enormous numbers of them served in the Vietnam. Uh, it wasn't a military school, but they all sort of answered the call. And there's some really extraordinary stories in that. It's called Red Rivers in a Yellow Field. The Red Rivers refer to the three main rivers of Vietnam. The South Vietnam flag was a yellow field with three red stripes on it. It all has to do with that Vietnamese experience. And uh, uh, so that's a kind of interesting, different take. There are a couple of, um, there's a book on of short stories over there about growing up in the 1950s and 60s on the beach in the summer resort. Uh, there's a book of poetry. There um, are several brand new books that literally came out just last year, one on the campus architecture of Georgia Tech and another one on Atlanta's public art, um, uh, the outdoor sculpture in Atlanta and, uh, and murals. And when I started working on that about a year ago, I discovered there are over 1,000 murals on buildings in Atlanta. Uh, some of them are here in Decatur, but I mean the whole Atlanta area. And so that was a formal thing. Obviously, they're not all in the book, but a, a selection of them and, and, and different things. So those two are, are brand new. And uh, um, we can, uh, if you're interested in purchasing any, I can sign them or dedicate them if you like. And um, we have a visa that we can use, I think, if uh, you know, locally, but also um, uh, check it. Cash will be fine. But I hope something interests you. And, uh, Thank you all for coming. I hope it's not pouring down rain. I think it's supposed to be a little bit